Hopefully you made your way to Acts chapter 20, and we're going to stand and read, starting at verse 17, as we look at our message, Explosive Leadership. Picking up in verse 17. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know, from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you. Serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. Now I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see now, I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things which will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulation await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Father, we ask now that you would open our eyes by your spirit, that we'd see wonderful things, that you would feed us and nourish us and build us up by this word of grace that is coming to our hearts. I just pray for everyone that has gathered today in the, in the house and those who are watching online. Lord, you want to minister your love and grace and truth to their hearts and my heart. So, Lord, we're just asking right now that we would receive all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to share with you 10 observations of leadership that comes from the incredible Paul the Apostle as he's trying to make his way to Ephesus. So he calls these, or excuse me, Jerusalem. So he calls these Ephesian elders to travel 45 miles to come up and have a leadership meeting with him. He's going to be handing off the reins of this ministry. They're elders, they're they're pastoring, they're leading, they're ministering to an incredible work that Paul the Apostle has spent more time there than any other place that we have recorded in the book of Acts. We see for sure he spent three years there teaching daily, so much so that the gospel went all over Asia out of this metropolis center of Ephesus. Now, if Paul, in his his strategy, as the Holy Spirit led him, he would go to major city centers, he would minister there, and then let God's people that grow begin to spread out into the satellite communities all around there. And this is what he does in his missionary journeys. Ephesus was a thriving city of some 250,000 people at the time. You can go to Ephesus today as probably one of the most spectacular, uh, reconstructed ancient cities in uh, antiquity because the British discovered it 100 years ago and they've been rebuilding just the facade so you kind of get the feel for it. It's very impressive. It's one of the seven churches that Jesus spoke to in the book of Revelation. And as we look at this, Paul the Apostle is going to display just by us simply observing, obviously not every concept about leadership is here, but there's 10 observable things that if you want to have influence in the smallest way to the largest way, if you're a mom and you're influencing your children, you're a leader. If you're a dad influencing the family, you're a leader. Your coworkers, you can have influence because you see leadership is just influencing others for good or for evil. Adolf Hitler, can we say it, was an incredible leader with demonic empowerment to destroy the world. This guy was effective. He knew how to bring leadership and focus, and he did it around hatred and a common enemy, which was everybody that was not of the Aryan race or uh, fair-skinned, blue-eyed, blonde-haired type of dynamic. He did it through racism. That was his mojo. Oh, isn't it interesting right now, there's an an incredible movement across America that's all about racism, but it's now in reverse against who? Those who are white. Every other marginalized group, all of you white people, especially if you're a cis man, which means you're, you're just normal, <laughs> right? They got a name, we used to call it normal, but now you're cis uh, man. If you're white, 
heterosexual Christian man, you are the problem. I am the pro I am the oppressor. Thank you for coming to this oppressive service today. I'm going to heap a bunch of garbage on you because in every interaction, there's an oppressor and an oppressee. And in this case, you're the oppressee and I'm the oppressor. <laughs> this stuff is so stupid. You're like, Pfft. it's ridiculous. But anybody that wants to make the issue racist, racist, isn't it interesting how everybody rallies to get around it? Right? Doesn't matter what color. Just pick your color and rally that the other color is the problem, which is ridiculous because we all came from one set of parents. We all have the same set of grandparents, Adam and Eve, and then at the flood, <laughs> Noah and Mrs. Noah. We all have the same. The only difference in the human race is the content of melanin. That's it. Some of you are so transparent, I can see right through you. You got no melanin. And some of you are much darker. You're blessed with melanin. We're all created in the image of God. So we can bring unity around. We're all the human race. We all reflect the image of God no matter what color we are, right? That's unifying. But I also can posture and turn you against another race of people if I choose to. Any race you choose. I can work it up because that's what racist people do. That's what the devil does. Identify a group of people, motivate people through hatred. Because two things motivate. Uh, motivate. You're either a victim or you're a victor, right? If you want to tell people, Yo, just, you're a victim, I don't care who you are. If you give effort to your life in school, on the team, in work, you'll rise out of wherever you're at. Expend effort, doesn't matter how much melanin you got or not, right? So, as we look at this, these 10 observations, first of all, we see that number one, obviously leadership is initiative or initiating, it says in verse 17, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. Leaders see the need. He saw the need to encourage and build these people up for the important job they had. He didn't wait for them to respond to him. He initiated it and said, hey, come up here. Travel 45 miles. It's not easy to travel back in those days. They got some skin in the game if they want to come. Hey, come to this conference. I'm going to teach. I'm going to download. I'm going to influence you because you have a big task in front of you. Initiation is just the simplest thing. You know, when my kids were little, I wanted my kids to love Jesus, right? I wanted them to love Jesus. So at nighttime, we put them to bed. Now we talk to them about the Lord all day long, but uh, we also had this little picture Bible to share the word of God with them. We went through a couple of them and just wore the, the uh, covers right off the things. We're uh, praying with them at night. I had a song for each one of our children when I put them to bed. It's funny, now I go hang out with the grandkids. And my daughter's like, hey, do you want to put Tiber to bed or you want to put Galilee Grace to bed? I'm like, okay, what's, what's, your, what's your routine? What do you? She's like, oh, just sing them the songs that you sang to me, Dad, and to Caleb, and that's, that's the songs we sing them now. Right? So she just carries that on. <laughs> so, so it's like this deja vu 30 years later. Now I'm with a, a grandchild laying in bed, and I'd sing this song to my daughter from the time she was a baby. The Lord bless thee. And yet every time I said, bless you, I'd put, touch the end of her nose like this. And I, I didn't know, but my daughter does that to Tiber, right? So he's just waiting for me to, you know, to touch his nose. <laughs> the Lord, and the Lord keep you. Touch his nose. You know? And you're singing a blessing on them every single night. The blessing's not enough. They need to know the words. So when, as they got older, I'm like, okay, in the morning when they had school year, you meet at the fireplace at 6.30 in the morning. So I had to meet at 6.30. We would all read a verse after the other through the book of Proverbs, whatever day of the month it is. And then we would all go around and say, pick our favorite verse, and then we would pray for the day. I got a test. I'm having a problem with Johnny. He's trying to pick on me on the playground, whatever it was. And we'd pray. Initiation is the first step in having influence with anybody. Passivity is not influence. Passivity is not leadership. Just thinking things are going to happen. By, people that are passive go, well, somebody's going to do it. 
Yeah, but if, what if you really love that person that you want something to happen with and you're just waiting for the miracle person to come and initiate something? Who's going to initiate change in your family, in the marriage, at work, on the team, in school? Initiation is just simply saying, Lord, how can I help other people get close to you? That's it. How can I help other people? And then begin to do those simple things. He initiates. He also demonstrates, because it's not enough to initiate. But it says in verse 18, when they had come to him, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. Now, I can initiate and want to draw people to the Lord, but in leadership, the initiation must be backed up by demonstration. They must see it, it's real in my life. We call this being authentic. So he said, you guys know from the very first day I came to Asia how I live my life. We are around each other 24-7, seven, seven days a week. He's a single guy, so he's not maintaining the marriage. He's not maintaining children. So he just worked nonstop. Paul the Apostle is a machine, a missionary machine. And he says, you guys watch my life, how I serve God, and I was humble in all humility. Meaning, in our service to the Lord, initiation and leadership is not feeling, coming across like you're uh, the smartest guy in the room. It's not coming across like you have all the answers. It's not coming across forcefully. It's actually the opposite of servant leadership, which is humility, which is lowering your opinion of yourself, making the Lord the hero of the story and serving other people. That's what humility is. Pride is a preoccupation with self. Every single one of us in this room is prideful. You wake up thinking about yourself. You have lunch thinking about yourself. You go to sleep thinking about yourself. You have dreams thinking about yourself. Somebody shows you a group picture, you're looking for yourself. <laughs> Don't care who it is. Now that picture has 20 people in it and 19 of them have amazing, suave, cool smiles. And you're, you look cross-eyed looking down. Now, from your perspective, is that a beautiful picture? No, because you don't care that the 19 other people look good. You look like a dork. You and I are preoccupied with ourselves from morning till night, our waking moment. And it's probably amplified the most from about 14 to 25. 10 years, maybe, 15 to 25. And we are convinced we know all. It's called the know-it-all stage. When you raise kids, it's a very, very terrible wilderness you enter into. Your children ask you a question, you give them the answer, and immediately they say, no, sir, that's no way. So, Why'd you ask the question if you didn't want the answer? You asked the question so that you could correct me and tell me just how out of touch I was with everything. It was Mark Twain that said, I thought my dad at 15, when I was 15, I thought my dad was the stupidest man on the planet. And when I turned 25, I was amazed how much he had learned in the last 10 years. <laughs> right? It wasn't the dad that changed. It was Pop. I mean, it was him. So it's with all humility and tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. Just because I'm influencing others doesn't mean I am not also making enemies. I have people that hate my guts. I have people that talk trash behind my back. I have people that diss me on social media. I have people that lie about me, straight up lies. I minister in one town for 25 years, starting a church from nothing, growing up to 3,000 people, and it was amazing. I learned the most creative stories about myself. I would have people say, I would meet somebody away from church. And as I introduced myself, they'd kind of, their eyes would get big and say, oh, you're that guy. I said, who's that guy? And they'd say, well, this is what I heard about you. And they'd tell me this big elaborate story. I'm like, I, I don't know who that is. They said, it's you. I said, I, I don't even slightly resemble whatever that whole thing was. Because it was a Mormon community, most of the lies were about somehow I had been kicked out of the Mormon church. That previously I was a Mormon bishop. And now I know I do look like a Mormon. I've looked like a Mormon for a very long time. It's my haircut. I like this haircut. And, um, you know, I'm nice. So maybe that's all the the farther that goes. But it was basically, I was an apostate that had been kicked out of the Mormon. It, like it was a very elaborate story. And I had to give them credit in the sense that they're very creative in their delusional world. None of it's true, right? But they're very creative. 
You see, leadership is not only a, a, a initiating, but other people have to see me go through the fire of life and see how I handle it. Through the tears, through the trials, through people hating my guts. People are startled usually when they start following a leader and then they meet a few people that hate them. They're like, oh no, they said this about you. I'm like, well, you've been hanging out with me week in and week out. Every day we're in the, what, for the last six months, who would you say, I, am I that guy? I said, absolutely, I haven't seen any of those things. I said, there you go. Once you finally become as wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove, you realize people are liars, right? You're liars. And there are people that hate individuals that are doing good things. As a matter of fact, you can oftentimes take the temperature or measure the effectiveness about who their enemies are, right? If all these people hate this guy, he must be doing good things. <laughs> so when you look at it, it's like, oh. The, the weekend I left for my last time of being at the church for all those years, that weekend we had like 3,300 people that came to church. And, uh, but the interesting, two weeks later when the whole community found out that I'd left, 400 more people came that had been over 25 years offended by me in some way. I called it the hate Rick Church that was spread all over the place. And they came back because the, you know, the bum is finally gone. <laughs> and I thought it was comical. I thought it was funny. Because if you would ask any of them one-on-one -on -one, what was the issue, well, they didn't like this message or they don't like that the Bible said that and Rick believed that it did say that and so we're offended by God's word. It's like, well, if God's word offends you, I can't do anything about that. But you see, the people that I influence, the leaders that are close to me, they're hanging out with me day in and day out. They see the tears, they see the trials, they hear the lies, and they're not duped by that stuff. So often people that would be close, have been close to me over the years, they'll say, I had this conversation with this person and they said X, Y, and Z about you, and I spend like every week with you, and I tell them, that's not even close to who Rick is, right? But you have to have thick skin and keep a tender heart towards the Lord and people. But you know what happens to most people is they get thin-skinned and they get a hard heart. So now they get touchy about everybody saying something. Solomon has a great verse that I have lived out in the ministry years. Solomon said, if you hear your servant cursing you behind your back, don't take it to heart because you yourself know that you've talked bad about others in your past. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's kind of personal, right? <laughs> so don't take it too too badly when other people are talking trash about you. So you have to understand, you have to demonstrate a solid, stable leadership that's plowing through life, doing good things in a humble servanthood to God, and yet you have a lot of detractors and a lot of haters and people that are plotting against you. That's just part of the scenario. You cannot be a leader without having enemies. Ask Jesus. what they do? They nailed him to a cross. Ask Paul. what they do? They chopped his head off. Ask Peter, they hung him on a cross upside down. You cannot have influence without, if, if you don't want to have any influence and no enemies, do nothing and you'll be set. You'll be set. Just hide out, be under the radar, never offend anybody, right? You won't have much effectiveness in life to touch any, any, anyone else with good things. But you'll be safe. You'll be safe. Thirdly, this concept and observation of communicating in verse 20 says, how I kept not back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews, also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I communicated to you fully. I kept nothing back. A lot of leaders feel it's their job to hold back a lot of important information so they have a corner on the market of it. Meaning that they don't want to, well, if I tell you everything I know, well, you'll know as much as me. And I, I don't like that, they think. No, that's not Paul's mentality. It's not mine. If I've learned it, I want to pass it on to other people. 
So Paul said, I kept nothing back. I proclaimed it. I taught you publicly and house to house. It's a, a big public meeting, and, and we're also at a home fellowship. doesn't matter if it's a big meeting, a small meeting. I'm talking to Jews who I have the basis of talking about Jesus from the Old Testament, and also the Greeks who I'm just talking about uh, a, a general um, approach that God is the creator. But it's always the same message. Repentance towards God, which means repentance means turn or change. So you're turning towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead. The message stays consistent in your communication. Endurance, you have to have endurance because it's a long race. Did you know that it, within five years, people that come out of Bible college, seminary, anything and enter into ministry, within five years, 80% of people in ministry quit. 80%. Why? Because they're not prepared for the relational conflict you are going to have. It is a brutal world. And you find out what's really inside of people. And it's the friendly fire that's the most painful, people that get really close to you. And then try to sink your ship because they have some selfish ambition of their own. Somehow they, they're gonna destroy you and that props them up. It's not for the faint of heart to enter in. And Paul the Apostle is that ultimate example. By the time he wrote this, he's been ministering for about 22 years. I've been a pastor now for 35 years. And let me tell you, if I would have known how rough it was going to be going in, I may have been a little more hesitant to jump in head first. But it's almost like the Lord in his wisdom knows, well, I'll just get him so deep in. By the time he really discovers how hard this is, there's no turning back. Right? There's, no, there, there's nowhere else you can go at that point. You're, you're fully committed. You feel like a, a little bit like, I think it's Cortez, that landed with his troops and then had the ships burned so the guys couldn't think there's any way of retreat. Like, we burned the boats, guys. There's only one direction. That's forward. So we see the endurance in verse 22. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that the chains and tribulation await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone, preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. He now lays out his future and what he's going to have to endure. And the first thing he says, that I'm not sure, I, I, I'm, I'm bound up by the Spirit of God to go to Jerusalem. But every town I stop in on the way, there's all these words of prophecy saying, don't go, you're going to be in chains, you're going to prison. Agabus, a famous prophet in the book of Acts, he predicts or prophesies about a famine that happens, and it did happen. He's there with Paul the Apostle. They're at Philip the Evangelist's house, and he takes Paul's belt off of him in a very dramatic prophet, Old Testament type of way. And he binds his hands and he binds his feet with the belt of Paul. And he says, the guy that owns this belt, his hands and feet are going to be bound, and he's going to jail. And Paul was right there. He's telling him, dude, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be in chains and you're going to be in prison. So when everybody heard the prophecy at the home fellowship there, they all begin to beg Paul, like, don't go, don't go, the Holy Spirit said. So there's two ways to look at this. And depending on how mature you are or how much you've studied the scripture, you have a perspective. There are those who believe Paul the Apostle is in sin because he's going bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, that all the people speaking to him prior to him, uh, him getting there, were telling him, don't go, don't go, don't go. No, they were telling him, when you go, there's going to be chains in prison. It's a little bit like Jesus when he was going, you know, for weeks he said, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be abused, and I'm going to rise from the dead for the third day. And, and Peter takes him aside and says, not so, Lord, this is not going to happen to you. And he says, you get behind me, Satan, because this is God's plan for me to go to the cross. So you either believe that Paul is in God's will, which I personally believe, but I would say the most Bible teachers believe that Paul the Apostle is outside of God's will and he's trying to kick the door down in rebellion against God's message of warning and going to Jerusalem. I don't see it that way, but you can choose which one you like. Paul the Apostle, as he lays it out here, he said, this is what I'm doing. I am bound in the spirit. The, the motivation is towards Jerusalem and I, there's chains in prison. Now, if I told you next Sunday, 
when you go down to visit your family in San Diego, you're going to be in chains in prison for your faith in Jesus if you show up at their church service. Are you going? Yeah, somebody is. There was one yes, and uh, there's about uh, 300 no's by sheer silence. I think I'm going the opposite way somehow. I'm getting about as far as Diego as I could possibly get, right? Why? Because we, obviously, none of us are, are, are looking, I mean, ho I hope not, none of us are looking to be martyrs, right? I, I'm not looking for handcuffs. I've been in handcuffs, it's unpleasant. I've worn orange coveralls, it's not a good look on my complexion. It's not my color, you know, as they say in California, what's your colors? I don't know what my colors are. I'm from Idaho. We don't do men colors in Idaho, all right? And if there is a man color, it's camo and ammo. Camo and ammo. So anyway. But the thing that Paul in verse 24, it's probably one of the most epic verses of self-description in his life. And many people have made it their life verse. But let me just sink down in it and drill down into it a little bit with you to see if you want this to be your life verse. Because there's concepts here that are so penetrating to the spiritual depth of Paul and who he is and what he wanted to be for God. Verse 24 says, none of these things move me. None of what things? Warnings about chains and prison and death. Does it, doesn't slow me down, doesn't deter me, does not divert me. It does not move me away from the will of God for my life. Do you realize how easily you and I are moved away from God's will if we look ahead and it looks hard? That's hard. I don't think I want to do that. Anything hard, you and I are in the soft, fluffy, mushy, I want to be happy zone of the Christian life, of the bless me club. That anything that smacks of self-denial, affliction, difficulty, and might, you might get chapped lips, you're not signing up for. Right? You're easily moved. I'm easily moved in this soft version of Christianity that is now formed in America's prosperity. And he says, nor do I count my life dear to myself. Most of us, that's all we count dear to her, is ourselves. Right? Me. I want my life to be pampered and blessed. I want a spa day, right? Not, not a, a difficult day. Where's, where's my spa? I want a piece of cucumber on each eyelid. I'm going to get a mud facial. I'm going to get a manicure and a pedicure. Uh, you want to come help us serve God this weekend? It could be hard. No, thank you. I'll pray for you. Do you need a donation? I'll write a check. Because we count our life dear to ourselves. And he says that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. See, I, I want to finish my race with joy. And the only way to finish a race is running, right? You're not walking. You're running. And what are you running for? You're running for the finish line. What are you running for? You're running to win your best race. I'm not racing against you or any other Christian. I'm, I'm racing against the poor version of me, which is totally self-absorbed and cares nothing about God's will or other people. <laughs> that guy doesn't run at all. <laughs> he doesn't even do a walk-a-thon. I mean, he, this, this guy wants nothing to do with anything except coffee at Starbucks. But the person that is going to run a race, Jesus at the, is at the finish line. And so there's this wanting to finish our race with joy because I received this race from the Lord Jesus. And that's the thing, right? Jesus gave Paul the Apostle this lane to run in. This is his calling. It's nobody else's calling among the elders of Ephesus. His calling is not their calling. His, their calling is to go back to Ephesus and to be the best elders they can be. He's got his own calling. I cannot run your race and you cannot run my race. Don't look at other people's races or lanes and be envious of them because you can't run for them. You have to run the race Jesus gave you. What is that race? Figure that out and discover what God has for you. And so now he tells them, kind of in a final way of how he finished his race there at Ephesus, therefore, he's testifying in verse 26, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men and I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. 
He tells them two things. I, I was with you guys for three years, and I'm innocent of the blood of every man. This is a concept that we get from the book of uh, Ezekiel about a prophet who has to faithfully, if he gets a word from the Lord, he has to faithfully tell the people, therefore, if they ignore it, 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 the blood's not on his hands because he told them. So that's my job, and I have been doing that for 35 years. I tell people the only way to get to heaven and for your sins to be cleansed, for you to enter in before the throne room of God and hear well done, is through faith in Jesus' finished work, his death upon a cross for your sins, his burial and his resurrection, and through faith in him you will have everlasting life. And people have to either receive that message or reject that message, but their blood is not on my hands. Because I have told them not only the good news, you can go to heaven if you believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. You can be saved and forgiven of your sins. I can tell you the bad news. If you do not, you are going to go to hell forever. Did he just say hell in 2023 in America? Where we're supposed to have a group hug and only sing kumbaya and say positive things? That's not the kind of church service I want to go to. The church I was at last Sunday, they brought up people that are going through the transition of being a transsexual, and they affirmed them as the bravest people they know. And that was the church I was at last Sunday, and then you came here. I came here. I was invited by a friend. They drug you in. They promised in and out Burger afterwards. You came. You were totally duped for some fries and a double animal, you know, burger. And here you are. And he just said, I only have the choice to believe in Jesus and go to heaven. And if I don't, I'm going to hell. Therefore, I am innocent of the blood of all men and all women. You cannot shy away from sharing the exact reality, spiritually speaking, that the Bible reveals and be a faithful minister. You cannot. You should go sell real estate if you cannot. If you cannot tell the truth in love and declare the entire, as he goes on from there, I'm innocent of the blood of all men, which means he clearly presented Christ and him crucified. It's your choice whether you believe or not. But then he said, I did not shun to declare to you the whole counsel of God. From Genesis to Revelation, I left nothing out. I shared with you the word of God. So for Christians, I fully taught God's word. That's why the Anchored series is so important, reading through God's word in two years. We're trying to bring God's people through it, inspiring them from a message that comes from the weekend services. Sixth, there's the exhorting in verse 28, which is the positive of what these elders need to do. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. You have some sheep to watch over, these elders do. And they were purchased, they were bought with the blood of the lamb, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, shed his blood, and these are his sheep, so you should take very seriously your charge to be shepherds of them. Take really good care of these sheep because they're Jesus' sheep. We are not the good shepherd, we are under shepherds of the good shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. We point to him, but we wanna be faithful ministers. And so in the positive, be a shepherd that's watching out for sheep, that feeds sheep, that tends sheep, that ministers to sheep. And that's what we're doing here in the ministry. But then that's the exhortation that is very positive. Be a good shepherd because the uh, people you're shepherding have been bought with Jesus' blood. But here's the strong warning in verse seven, or uh, number seven, verse 29. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. He said, <laughs> he said I want you guys positively to be good shepherds, but realize this. What do shepherds watch out for? Wolves. You have to encourage people to be a good shepherd and overseer with their responsibilities, but you have to warn them against wolves because wolves come into every single congregation. Wolves want to destroy, and shepherds want to destroy wolves. When we discover you're a wolf, we'll be talking to you very strongly. If you want to see my smiley, I love Jesus face turn into stone cold killer, let me find out you're trying to destroy some of the sheep, and you and I will be having a very serious conversation why are you messing with these sheep? Why are, we had this guy coming to the church, 
and he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Everybody just was singing his praises, but for a couple of us, we thought, there's something wrong with this guy. He's bringing in this guy, and this guy's handicapped, and it looks like he's this wonderful, good Samaritan, quote, Christian person, but there's just something, just the Spirit of the Lord's like, there's something wrong with this guy. He's, he's like a wolf. And so we, we said, well, we don't know what to do. Let's not have evil suspicion. Let's just pray. Let's just pray that God gives us wisdom. And after a couple of weeks, we get this random phone call from out of state. And I get the phone call as an assistant pastor. And they said, hey, is, is there a such and such guy going to your church? I said, yeah, this guy just showed up a month ago. They said, we heard he had arrived there. And I just wanted to give you the heads up. This guy goes from church to church, state to state, ingratiates himself for a short season at a congregation, shares with them about his incredible business model, and rips people off for about 40 to 50 grand from their life savings for his business model. Then he moves on to the next church, and he moves on to the next state. He's a moving target. About every six to 12 months, he moves, and he takes advantage of these people. And that's what he was doing there. He was starting to grease the wheels, making himself look like he's this wonderful sheep. He's helping a handicapped person. You know, I don't know where he found him out on the street. Hell, bring you to church. Like he needed a prop, right? They, he has, a, he has a, 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 a shtick that he always does. So when I find out, I get one of the elder, other elders. Like it's very much like the book of Ephesians. Like, hey, you, you got to watch out for these wolves because they're going to try to take, care of, or take advantage of God's people. So we go knock on the door. And we sit down, and, and, and now that that person that I talked to, they actually knew three other people. So I followed up, and I checked their story. All their stories are identical. Like, he destroyed these people financially. And so as we're sitting there talking, I said, hey, you know, I got this phone call from, and, you know, at first he's like this, you know, this perfect, just like the Jesus, plastic Jesus. And as, as soon as I mentioned the person's name, boy, the, the old sheep mask came off. And he realizes he was out, and I said, and I talked to them, and I talked to them, and I talked to them. And at the end of it, as he realized, I mean, there was no backing out of this with all the people I've just talked to, which are the last three or four people he's ripped off. He goes into this sinister smile, and he's like, well, I guess I'm found out. Get out of my house. So we left the house. I get a, a letter about six weeks later. Addressed to me, because I'm the one that confronted him. And his letter, he is so brazen. He wrote this letter saying, I've moved away. He didn't tell me the location, because he knew I would be like, <laughs> like trying to warn the people against it. But he said, I've uh, moved to a new location, and I found a new group of gullible people, spiritual people. And I just thought, I'd let you know. How do you wake up in that headspace? You know what I mean? It's flat out evil. And, and, and Paul's telling his elders, you need to be a good shepherd. You need to take this seriously. These are God's people bought with Jesus' blood. He says, but you also have to pay attention with wolves that come in. But he said, the wolves are not only going to come from outside. Sometimes within the old, your own team, the elders that were right there he was talking to, some of them are going to rise up and go, you know, I, I think I need to take have a church split. I'm going to take half of these people because I'm, I'm the guy that really has the message. And you'll see that. I've been through the good, the bad, and ugly in church life for the last 40 years. Talk about people that say they've got a word from God. And when you look at the wake, they've just destroyed people. It's always about them. So they want their prominence. Paul warns them about this. He said, I warned you night and day for three years with tears that God told me this was going to happen. Then you have to learn how to come in. Now, if I'm that concerned with a group of people, sometimes I think to myself, well, only I can be here and fix this. Only I can be among these others. No, no, you have to learn how to commend. Can I share with you, parents, if you haven't went through the process of commending your children to the Lord when they get old enough to move out and go on, you think you somehow still have to parent them like that helicopter parent wrapping them in bubble wrap? No, 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 it's not the way it works. Look at this, verse 32, how to commend. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I commend you. It means to give, I, I give you over to God and to the word of his grace. So God is gonna take care of you, but he's given you the word of grace to instruct you and I'm going to trust God and his word to give your life direction and I have to go do something else, 
We do that with our kids, right? They grow up. We did our best. Parents bemoan, you know, my son or daughter, they're not walking with the Lord. I brought them to church. I did this and that, and I, I messed up this way. <laughs> Forget all that. You are not a perfect parent, right? Neither am I. Did you have perfect parents? No, because you live on planet Earth. And the only redemption is one day your children are not going to be perfect parents, and hallelujah for that, right? Because they're going to know that they are not perfect. I look at my parents, my life was dysfunction junction. I mean, seriously. My mom's been married four times, my dad's been married three times, there's seven marriages, there's stepbrothers and stepsisters, and drama, and prison time, and yeah, I mean, just like, you, you name it. It was just like this. But I can step back as I come to Jesus and go, you know what, they, they did the best they could with what they had, which wasn't much. You know how freeing that is? Because, you know, once I'm an adult, I can no longer go through life blaming my folks that I'm a twerp, right? Because you're an adult. It's on you now. It's not your parents' fault. Your, your 35-year-old comes home for Thanksgiving and says, you know, my life's a mess, mom and dad. It's all because of you. Say, well, you know, we did the best we could with what we had. And we're sorry that, you know, some of these things you haven't been able to let go of but you've been a very big boy for a long time. And the only problem you have right now is that when you wake up in the morning and look in the mirror, you realize the only person that can make a difference in your life is you. How you respond to adversity is the test towards maturity or bitterness. How you respond to the adversity of life either makes you better or it makes you bitter. It makes you a bitter victim or a victorious warrior for the Lord. And oftentimes from the hardest place you come from and God changes your life, the more free you are. Because you know what? If I'm 58 years old as I am today, whatever I am today is not my parents' fault. It's my adult self fault for whatever I am. So I guess that's how I found myself here. I don't know why I'm up to what I'm up to, but here I am, right? <laughs> You have to commend. I tell people, commend your children to the Lord when they're adults. Stop talking to them and trying to correct them. Stop. They will distance themselves. They're trying to find their own legs. Let them make their own mistakes. Tell God on them and pray like crazy. They can't escape that. Just tell God on them. Every time you want to talk to them, just tell God about it. Every time you want to talk, tell God about it. And, and pretty soon they just go, I don't know what's going on. Every time I turn around, I got these people, God people like coming at you just smiles. Yeah, I've been telling God, I, I call it launching parental bombs of love <laughs> towards him in prayer. Let God, you know, tell God on him. Laboring, verse 9. We're out of time. I've got to hurry. Verse 33. Laboring. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul the Apostle now, laboring is so important. He was a tent maker. So Though there were people that gave to his work in ministry at various times, especially the Philippians shared with him more than any other church, apparently very generously, he came into every community and he's a tent maker. And so he just would go into the marketplace and he makes tents and repairs tents and he would make money and, and make not only enough for himself, but for some of the people that were with him, supporting those who are weak, even being able to give to other individuals. Now, since he was laboring and he's taking care of himself, he wasn't coveting other people's silver and gold. You know, this whole social justice movement is about envy. They see people that are successful they have done nothing and they hate your guts because you're successful. You should give them your wealth that they've never worked for a day in their life. It's covetousness. It's the 10th commandment. And they want to, if they can't demand you to give it, then they want to steal it from you. And it's okay, right? Because they can walk right into a store and take $950 worth of stuff and it's not even against the law. They're entitled. Are they? Really? No, they're, they're covered in that stuff. If they were just out working and making their own money from the labor of their own hands, even Paul the Apostle that did this. He's given them a model that when you work, hey, I'm not coveting what you got. 
I'm just, this is a beautiful thing of being around a lot of nice things and nice houses and nice cars. And I have friends that are billionaires and millionaires and very wealthy and very successful. And I get to hang out with them. And many of them, obviously, if they're in my circle, they've, they've found Jesus and they're walking with the Lord. But when I stay at their house, when I hang out with them, which they're, these people, some of them are my dearest, closest friends. This is the reality, folks. I don't covet what they have. I don't covet their, their property or their position. I rejoice with them. Like when I'm there, I'm just, this is so cool. This is awesome. And I get to be here. This is such a great time. But I've discovered no matter how rich you are, you only sleep in one bed at night. Right? And, and, and no matter how rich you are, you drive one vehicle at a time. You might have a fleet of them, but you just drive one vehicle. And, and no matter how rich you are, depending on what you put on this one plate, but this one plate, I mean, you might have caviar and lobster. It's, I mean, like, you know, amazing food. But I could have a bean burrito, rice and beans, and I'm pretty happy. So pray tell, tell me. And as long as my body is covered with clothing, I'm all right. As long as I'm not naked. Now, I would cover some clothes right now. Just so that you know, the worst nightmare a preacher can have is the nightmare you're dreaming and somehow you came to church unclothed. It's a bad one. Well, I've woke up in, in a total sweat. Like, oh, oh, oh. Woo, woo. You're up here. Oh, no. I should have got the podium with it. It has a block back here. That, there's no wood. It's awful. Uh, no. The second worst nightmare of a preacher is that this is, I've had this, this is weird. I've had this dream many times. The people come into church and I'm up here, but I can't find the, the verse. And I'm looking at them, no, wait, wait, wait. You know, 15 minutes, people start leaving. No, I'll really get it, really. And, I, and at the end, I finally get it. And the last person just walked out of church. Because I took some, look, I'm just sharing with you, you know, this. If you're a psychological analyst, you're probably going somewhere with that. I don't know what all that means. He's the naked guy and he can't find a verse. I don't know, whatever that means. Anyway, he says, if I labor, laboring to me and always being able to work, when I started two churches, both times, I was working full time. I had to work my brains out, plus do church every weekend for a long time. My wife sacrificed, my children sacrificed. It was, it's huge sacrifice. And he was telling me, you guys know how I worked. When I went to Idaho Falls, I worked for a year, 50 hours a week, as a tile and marble guy, on the road five days a week. And when I got home, I had to study all weekend for the Sunday message and then leave Sunday night to go on the road for another 50 hours. I, I'm on the road with these guys in this hotel room. This, these are my traveling buddies. These are my tile, you know, on the road. Construction guys are really excited. So we, we've, got a, <laughs> we've got four of us in a... a, a at one specific hotel where they have this, uh, a lot of beds in this room because you go to the cheapest place to keep the cost down. I'm, in the room, I'm trying to read my Bible for the Sunday message. The guy next to me is down in a 12-pack, and all night he's just looking at his Playboy magazines and you know, throwing them over by me and go through his Playboy and throwing them. And, and then <laughs> the next guy, is, uh, he's a chain smoker, and so he's like the, the room is just like one big fog and cloud of smoke. And he's hard of hearing, so he's got the, ra the TV be blaring in there. And then my other friend is just smoking weed every night. And he only knows one verse when he would look at me and he'd go, God made every herb of the filth, bro. That's the only verse he knows. <laughs> this is my Monday through Friday experience in a hotel room, smelling like a cigarette, surrounded by Playboy magazines, smoking dope, blaring TV. And then I show up and then I got to share on Sunday morning with a group of people. I've been so sanctified and clean all week, you guys. Because <laughs> think, people think preachers stay in the basement and on Sunday somehow they have an elevator that lists, hello. <laughs> I've been in an ivory tower all week long talking to nothing but Jesus. <laughs> and I'm literally going through hell, like for a year of this. Laboring like this, so I wasn't a burden on anybody. As a matter of fact, I was making money to be able to pay the rent for the church to reach people for Jesus. Because G Paul the Apostle says here, and it's recorded nowhere else, write it down in your Bible. This is the only place it is. It's an oral tradition. It's not in any four of the Gospels. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Don't ever look for it in the four Gospels. It's not there. 
because it's an oral tradition that Paul the Apostle had heard from the early church, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And it's not true. If you had your choice of this experience, at your Christmas uh, work party, a friend at work that you're pretty close to, but from your perspective, not close enough to get a Christmas gift, you show up to the Christmas party and they actually got you a nice gift worth 100 bucks. You got them nothing. And that, uh, now, straight up, even as a believer, you just look at them and you lie through your teeth. Oh, oh, I got you something. It's, I forgot it at home. I'll, I'll bring it, you know, I'll get to you on Monday. No, it's, you should sit. Uh, uh, it's, it's on the shelf at Walmart. I'll get it for you next week. That's what you should have said, right? Because, why? Because, and that person looks at you and goes, you know, you've just been a blessing and encouragement to this. Don't get me anything. I didn't get this to get something from you. I just, I got great joy out of buying this. And when I saw it, I thought about you and I, I wanted to give it to you. In that exchange, who's the most blessed person? The person that gave it to you. Not the insecure person like, oh no, I gotta, somehow I gotta fix this. Right, I gotta get them. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. If you can go through life beginning to find ways in which you can be a blessing, even a small way, you don't have to have much to be a blessing. When we did our first building project, I announced to the church, we're going to buy this property, we're going to build this, and we ended up building, you know, on 27 acres, a facility that's worth, you know, like $15 million. And, but the very first thing, when I talked on the very first Sunday, a girl came up to me that had a little bit of a, a disability, mental disability. She worked at McDonald's. She's 16 years old. She had this unusual condition where her, uh, her cranium was extra small, and, and her name was Carrie. And she was just the sweetest, gentlest soul in Jesus. She just loved Jesus with all her heart. And, and she came up to me, and the very first person that gave me a check, she gave me a $15 check from her McDonald's that she was working on. She's probably working like, you know, 15 hours a week, 20 hours a week. She gives me this check. I was so overwhelmed emotionally knowing who Carrie was. And I, I said, Carrie, I said, when we move into this facility, which it took us about uh, 12 months to finally move in, I said, when we move into this facility, this $15, because back then it would work, it, it was a right correlation. I said, I want you, you to look up at the first light fixture, and I want you to remember this gift and that your $15 bought that light. And her heart, she, she was so radiant with joy at that thought that she could help God with his work with 15 bucks. She didn't have very much. It's, it's strange to me People that have the most give the least proportionally. They give the least proportionally. Oftentimes, those who have very little know what it is to struggle, and they give very generously to other people in need. You are the blessed one when you learn to look and not expect people to give you stuff, but to give it to other people. Lastly, you, know, you need to know how to leave. We're going to do that in just a second, just to encourage you. All right, and that is the 10th thought observation in verse 36. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. He didn't know how to leave. Pray, weep, cry, get the send off. After being in Idaho Falls for the 25 years we were there, I told the church, uh, in 30 days, the Lord's called me to do something else, so I have a whole month worth of ministry here, and I just want to tell you guys goodbye for 30 days. And it was brutal, and I knew what it was going to be like, because I don't like to cry publicly, I don't like to, and after every service, we were hugging, we were crying, people that I had I'd seen their marriages restored, I had dedicated their babies, and, and then I, I married that child that I dedicated, right, when they got older, the, relation, the depth of relationship. I went to our, I had, we started a school, so all the, the teachers, the kids in the school class would come out and hug me, and we're all, I mean, it's just like, it was a blubber fest for a straight up month. And it was soul crushing to me to have that. And yet I realized that I needed to say goodbye, and they needed to say goodbye. And that we're praying for one another and crying with one another and falling upon each other's necks and hugging each other because it would have been much easier just to not show up the next week and be gone emotionally. But it's great to have closure. 
I need to know how to come into a ministry humbly, but I need to know how to leave relationally in a rich way with meaningful relationships. Paul the Apostle to me is the ultimate because we have so much of his writing and his life and the exposure. Obviously, Jesus is number one in his leadership skills, but there is bar none second Paul the Apostle. But each one of us this week, each one of us in our lives, we have influence. And the way that you influence is be who God wants you to be. Just love God every day and love the people around you. And you're going to watch how God begins to use your influence in that simple dimension. Just love God today and love the people that he puts in your path. It's the coworker. It's this individual. It's they, how, whoever God brings. Just love them. Just care for them. And watch your influence for the kingdom. It will be super powerful. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and your kindness and your precious people. Thank you for your word that gives us clear instruction. Pray that you would help us now. Uh, Lord, we want to be people that are useful vessels for you as our king. May you receive the praise and the glory and the honor. And Lord Jesus, may you be the hero of our story day in and day out until we see you face to face. We ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.